to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to come talk. It's a great meeting. Uh, today, I'm going to break my talk into two brief sections. Hello. Okay. So the first section, I skipped a slide on accident. So is this? Okay. Can we, there we go. Not used to this. Uh, so I'm gonna break it into two brief sections. The first will be, I'll talk to you about our efforts, recent efforts to study the neurodevelopmental disorder Fragile X syndrome. And then that will kind of segue into our very recent published work looking at global genome-wide 5-methylcytosine and 5-hydroxymethylcytosine patterns and how they relate to gene-specific cell expression, gene expression. So Fragile X syndrome is the most commonly inherited form of intellectual disability. It's also very commonly associated with autism. It's caused by an expansion of a CGG repeat in the 5' prime UTR of the FMR1 gene, leading to loss of the fragile X mental retardation protein. Uh, generally, expansion to greater than 200 repeats of this, of this trinucleotide repeat is sufficient for diagnosis of fragile X syndrome. Now, FMRP is highly expressed in neurons, which explains the cognitive impairment and autistic behaviors upon loss of FMRP. So we've ident or we've generated iPS cells from five male fragile X patients, and all of them possess greater than 200 repeats indicating full, full uh, mutation fragile X syndrome except for one patient. Uh, these express and don't express FMRP. We were, ex we were surprised by this, but it can be explained by CGG rep repeat length mosaicism within the dermal fibroblast population. So we were able to isolate, even though patient 133 and 128 were clinically diagnosed with fragile X and autism, we were able to isolate IPS cells that still retain FMRP expression, so they, they'll serve as good controls. So one of the primary areas affected by Fragile X syndrome is the cortex. So we differentiated our iPS cells to four brain cortical neocortical neurons using a dual SMAD inhibition protocol. This generates mature electrically active neurons that are synaptically active and electrically active. But we've, we found something interesting when we started to uh, characterize the early stages of progenitor derivation we notice that the fragile X iPS cells are very capable of generating their, their PAC6 forebrain progenitors, but we see a dramatic reduction of beta-3 tubulin positive cells, or their immature neurons at this stage. We also observe a statistically significant increase in neurite length of these immature neurons in fragile X cells compared to the uh, untreated or the unaffected controls. So in order to understand what's going on at this early stage of neurodevelopment, what we're doing is we, we're building a, a kind of a molecular map of Fragile X syndrome using global gene expression data and epigenetics data, primarily DNA methylation data, to tease out some of these molecular phenotypes. When we looked at global DNA methylation profiles, we, we were surprised, somewhat surprised, to see that there is a very significant and distinct difference of the FMR1 negative Fragile X iPS cells compared to both of the, the unaffected controls and those Fragile X iPS cells that retain FMR1 expression, which are very closely correlated with the unaffected controls. Now, this is definitely a simplified view of things, and people that are familiar with epigenetics knows that, know that things can get complicated very quickly. And this slide is meant to scare you. Uh, but what I want you to take away from this for the next few slides is that 
5-hydroxymethylcytosine indicated by the gray lollipops is, is primarily enriched at promoters and enhancer regulatory elements of transcriptionally active genes in euchromatin. 5-methylcytosine will be enriched in the gene bodies of transcriptionally active genes, whereas 5-methylcytosine is enriched in the enhancers and promoter regulatory elements of transcriptionally repressed heterochromatic genes, and 5-HMC is generally absent. Now, traditional ways of looking at DNA methylation have relied upon sodium bisulfite treatment. And the big caveat that we discovered recently is that Sodium bisulfite treatment does not distinguish between 5-methylcytosine and 5-hydroxymethylcytosine. So we teamed up with our collaborator Chuan He at University of Chicago and Jian Bing at Illumina to develop the TET-assisted bisulfite TAB array in which through a series of chemical protection modifications, you can generate 5-HMC-specific data on the same human DNA methylation array that Illumina sells, not paid by Illumina. Uh, if you bioinformatically subtract the tab conversion or 5-HMC specific data from the standard bisulfite, what you get are 5-MC specific data. So in this way, by, by taking a DNA sample and splitting it into two biological replicates, you, or technical replicates, you can generate genome-wide 5-MC and 5-HMC specific pro profiles at single base resolution. So we wanted to know what the effects of 5-HMC were on the establishment of cellular identity. So we took human-induced pluripotent stem cells and differentiated them into cardiovascular progenitors or neural precursors according to standard protocols and determine cellular identity by immunofluorescence of a few markers indicative of each cell type. Now this is published work, so I'm not gonna go through all of, the, all of the methods that were required to, that the reviewers required to validate and normalize the data. But what I want to sh tell you is that we were able to identify a number of dynamically regulated loci, in this case cytosines, between that were common to both the standard bisulfite method and tabaret. Similarly, we, we also identified greater than twofold more dynamically methylated loci via tabaret than by standard bisulfite. Now, in order to understand if these dynamically regulated loci have functional significance, we used WGCNA which is a, a statistical program in R that is used to uh, detect covariance. We were able to identify 13 modules of dynamically regulated covariant cytosines, and we reasoned that the genomic location of these cytosines and the underlying uh, genes would probably be involved in developmental pathways or genes that regulate cell specification to these two different lineages. So we used GREAT to test for functional enrichment of genes it, that are regulated by these cytosines. So I'm not gonna go through all of the modules, but I wanna point out a couple of the more interesting ones. So in module 1B, we see a dramatic reduction of 5-methylcytosine when we differentiate to both, both types of progenitors. However, we see low levels of 5-hydroxymethylcytosine in IPS cells and a very significant increase when we, when we differentiate to cardiovascular progenitors but not to neural progenitors. Not surprisingly, this appears to be the establishment of euchromatin. Oops. Not surprisingly, this appears to be the establishment of euchromatin in the cardiovascular progenitor lineage as most of the genes that are associated with these regulated cytosines are involved in things like heart processes, heart morphogenesis, cardio, cardiac muscle cell development. In contrast, we observe two kind of different things in, in modules four and module seven. Here we see a dramatic increase in 
methylation in both cardiovascular progenitors in, in, model four, in module four, and in module seven, we see a dramatic increase in 5-MC and NPCs with decreases of 5-HMC. So we thought, okay, this is just going to be your typical heterochromatin establishment and silencing of neuronal type genes in the cardiovascular lineage. We were surprised to find that both modules converged on uh, functional enrichments specific for neuronal processes, specifically spinal cord motor neuron cell fate, uh, glial cell differentiation, spinal cord development. And many of these functional enrichments were, were exact matches between these two different modules that had gains of 5MC in two different cell types. And 13 of 59 genes within these matched terms were associated with cytosines from these two different modules. And 11 of those 13 genes are neuronal lineage specifying transcription factors, big time transcription factors. And two of them are involved in neuronal migration. Well, this was surprising to us, this, this enrichment of 5MC in neuroprogenitors at genes that are supposed to regulate neurogenesis because this protocol that we used to generate these neuroprogenitors has been shown recently by our group to functionally resolve or eliminate paralytic effects in models of uh, in multiple sclerosis post-transplantation of neuroprogenitors. So we looked at the genomic location of, of these enrichments of 5MC, and this will explain the discrepancies. So here again, enrichment of 5MC in module four was found to lie in distal regulatory regions, so like the enhancers that Alan talked to you about earlier, generally occur far upstream of transcription start sites. And similarly, the enrichment of 5MC in the neuroprogenitor cells was found just downstream of transcription start site. Now, the average gene is around 15 KB, so this would indicate enrichment of 5MC in gene bodies or gene activation of those genes in neuroprogenitor cells. So, it, to conclude, I want to, I hope that I've demonstrated that the tab array can generate 5HMC and 5MC maps at single base resolution and that this enables the examination of dynamic changes between these two epigenetic marks during differentiation. Importantly, Tabray distinguishes between 5MC loss with concomitant 5HMC gain, which would just appear to be uh, unchanged if you look via standard bisulfite treatment. And we've also seen evidence of cell type specific euchromatin and heterochromatin establishment, as well as developmental poisoning, which I didn't go into, but Alan talked about pretty eloquently. With that, I'll conclude and take questions.